Hi everyone, I'm instructor Diana Gonzalez and today we're going to go over savings for future goals part two. So in part one, we talked about effective rate and we derived a, a rule for effective rate that kind of had, uh, I think of it as a predicting factor where the idea behind it was if we have a certain amount of money and we let it compound for a certain period of time with a certain interest rate, what interest rate would give us the exact same amount but instead of using the compounding interest method, we can use the simple interest method. So we're going to kind of be using that idea of predicting and seeing how money behaves when we're thinking about the future to be able to derive a formula for uh, or a rule for savings. Okay. So this year I was supposed to go to Disney World uh, but then COVID happened and I was going to go and have a very cheap trip. But instead, now Adriana and I are going to plan to go to D Disney World August 2025 and we're going to go all out. So the question that we want to ask is how much should we deposit regularly into an account with a fixed interest rate to have a certain amount of dollars after a certain amount of years? Now, after some research, I determined or I gathered that the flight and the flights were going to be $2,000 for both of us. The hotel plus the six uh, park tickets, the bundle, Disney hotels, uh, $3,700. The food was going to be about $400 because we're really cheap and we'll bring our own food. And we like to go shopping. We like to buy these babies, these ears that I'm wearing. So approximately $1,000 each so that we can come back with a lot of stuff. In total, our trip together would be about $8,170.32. Now, prices are bound to increase. These ears go up like $10 every few months. And then as we discussed in previous videos, inflation for sure guarantees a price increase. So we're going to aim to save up about $10,000 and hopefully that'll be enough. Now, before we determine how much we need to deposit regularly, let's see how savings works. To do that, let's go through this example. So let's say that we deposit $100 into our credit union on the last day of every month. A little side note, I have a credit union account and I've learned that credit unions have the lowest interest rates on car loans, mortgage loans, and credit cards. So if you do have the opportunity to open up an account at a credit union and you, you feel comfortable doing so, you should take that opportunity. They also have higher interests on savings accounts so that you do make more money uh, than other banks. That's my little tidbit. Okay, back to the example. This account earns 1.5% per, uh, per year compounded monthly. So how much will we have in our account after five years, assuming that the interest rate stays the same? Now, something that is different about this example compared to the examples that we've done before with simple interest and compound interest is we're going to be depositing a certain amount monthly. So every month we're inputting $100. What we need to see is how often is that deposit compounded because that's how much that deposit is going to grow. So the very first deposit that we um, put into our account, we put it in at the end of the first month. So that means it's going to compound 59 times. It wouldn't compound 60 because as we've learned before, when you first put in the money, you don't gain any compound from that initial deposit. You didn't let it sit long enough for it to accrue any interest. So the first deposit is going to be compounded 59 times. Then similarly, the second deposit, we're going to deposit it to our bank account at the end of the second month, meaning it'll get to compound 58 times. Are we seeing a pattern? This should then be 57. It's the amount of compounding periods we have in our total term in our n, so 60, and then minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So the 57th deposit is only going to be compounded three times, 58, two times, 59, once, and the 60th deposit, we're putting it into our bank account at the end of our 60th month. At that point, we're done saving, so it doesn't gain any or it is not compounded, it doesn't accrue any interest. Now, something that's interesting to note here is, if you notice, the first few deposits are compounded 
a lot of times. And again, every month we're putting in a deposit. Let's assume we're not putting in a regular deposit. If you had the option to put in more money, it is beneficial to input more money into your account at the beginning. So like in the first few deposits, because that money is gonna sit and accrue interest for a lot longer than the last few deposits. Some food for thought. Now from here, <clears throat> we want to gain the balance on each of those deposits. So once we've made that deposit, we can think of each deposit as, as its own entity. And at that point, that deposit is co being compounded. So we can use our compound interest rule to determine what our balance is going to be for the first deposit. Our principal amount or our deposit was $100. And we can recall our interest rule and it's compounded 59 times. So this MT, this is the number of compounding periods. So the N, and that's what we have figured out in this column, in the second column. So similarly then, our second deposit, the total balance that we're going to gain from that is 100 times one plus I to the 58th because it's compounded 58, 58 times. So now we can fill out the rest of our table for the 60th deposit, I'm going to simplify our term real quick. Anything to the zero power we have learned is equivalent to one. So this is going to simplify to 100. Now notice I kind of separated each of the deposits into its own thing. So we got the balance for each deposit. Now the cool thing about all of this is this is our savings. So our total balance for savings is going to be the sum of each of the balances of these deposits. So if we write out the sum, we have, and I wrote it in backwards order because I think it's nicer in math to write uh, our terms in ascending powers. So our total savings is the sum of each of the deposits that we uh, derived in our, in our table. Okay. Now, this sum is a geometric series, and it simplifies to the following expression of 100 times the quantity 1 plus i to the 60 minus 1. And this portion right here, this is what looks like our effective rate formula. So again, kind of predicting. And we're dividing this, whole, this entire quantity by i, our rate per compounding period. Why do we want to come up with the rule for savings? As you can see, I use the ellipse to denote the, the 60 um, periods, but imagine saving up for 10 years or for more years or compounding more often. This can get very tedious and we, don't, we wanna be able to be efficient, so we're going to derive our rule. Now to derive our rule, we're going to use a, a trick that is often used in math or a technique, not a trick, a technique. So what we're going to do is we're going to make two copies of the total sum equation highlighted here in orange. We're going to take two copies of this equation and to one of those copies, to this first copy, we're going to multiply both sides by i. I mean by 1 plus i. So 1 plus i. I'm going to multiply this 100 times 1 plus i. Then as we learned in successive rates, when we multiply this, um, when we have repeated multiplication, we can change the powers. So for example, this 100 times one plus i times one plus i is the same as 100 times one plus i squared. Similarly, this would be cubed to the, f and then we go on. This one is to the 60th, 59th, 58th. So from here for the technique, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract both of these equations. We're going to subtract the original equation from this new equation that we derived. And this is going to help us get our savings rule. We're going to have S times one plus I minus S. Here what we're going to see is a lot of the terms are going to zero out. So for example, this term to the first power, since we're subtracting them, they zero out, the second power zero, zeros out, the third power, power will zero out from a term in here, all of these middle terms zero out, 58 will zero out here, the 57th will also zero out, and the 59th will zero out. So in the end, we have two terms left over, and we're subtracting the top equation from the bottom, 
So we'll have 100 times 1 plus i to the 60 minus 100. Okay? And for those of you who have taken Calculus 2 before or um, Algebra 2 and we saw geometric structures, this, uh, this pattern should make sense because in geometric sums we're looking at like final minus initial. So we're going to now simplify both sides of this equation by factoring out their common factor. On the right hand side, we factor out the s. On the, sorry, I don't know my left and right. On the left hand side, we factor out the s. On the right hand side, we factor out the 100. Now I'm going to clean up the left hand side. We see that there are two terms that can be simplified, or the zero out. So we're going to be left with s times i, c and then the right equation stays the same. Now at this point, I just want to remind us again, we are finding a savings rule. That means we are solving for s. So all we have to do to solve for s, since it's s times i, we learned in the mathematizing module that uh, the opposite of multiplication is division. Thus, we've arrived at the same expression that I illustrated earlier. Now that we've gone through this tedious derivation, Let's look at the generalized formula so that we don't have to derive this table all over again. So the generalized saving rule is the following. Just like before, we're going to keep some of the same terminology. So we have the accumulated amount in both the expanded version and the simplified version. D is a new variable that we're introducing, and this is our regular deposit. So either every month, every day, every year. After that, we have our interest rate. Now, we've talked about it in different uh, videos. You can think of it as I, which is the rate per compounding period, or you can expand it and have it be the rate divided by the, com uh, the compounding periods in one year. N is going to denote the number of periods in total, which is how we wrote it out on the table. So instead of um, writing it M times T, compounding periods times the years, we uh, went ahead and put them together to go by 60, 59, and like, that was our total periods. Okay, so this is going to be our savings rule. Now something to note, when we're using the savings rule, we already know the size of our regular deposit. We just want to see what's going to be, uh, what, how much we're going to have at the end, what our balance is going to be. The question that Adrian and I were answering is, or want to answer is, how much should we deposit monthly into our savings account, with schools first, uh, at a 1.5% fixed interest rate compounded monthly so that we each have $500 to go to Disneyland in five years. Disney World, sorry, not Disneyland. We already have annual passes for that. Notice what we're doing here. We're looking to see how much we should deposit. This calls for a deposit rule. Now, we can use the savings rule. That is why we went through the savings rule example. We can use the savings rule to find out what our deposit should be by solving for D. In this case, to solve for D, we can multiply or we can uh, divide by everything that is attached to D, or we can use a different method that we learned in the mathematizing module, which is multiplying by the inverse. If we multiply both sides of this rule by R over M divided by 1 plus R over M to the MT minus 1, ta-da! Again, all the variables, the representations stay the same, but in this case, we're solving for the deposit, so we know our goal. We know that we need to save $5,000. So how much do we need to deposit so that we can save those $5,000? Let us see. Our savings goal was $5,000. Our rate was 1.5, compounded monthly. I'm gonna plug this in to our rule. And we concluded that we need to deposit $80.30 per month for five years or for 60 months to go to Disney World in this bougie trip, which actually now that I come to think of it is very doable because that is less than what I pay for my phone. So I will be going to Disneyland in five years. Stay tuned. Have fun shopping.